When you're spring cleaning your house and yard this year, don't forget your finances. Hi everyone, I'm David Scranton. And just as your house doesn't clean itself, your money can get messy if you ignore it. Uh, and even messy enough to jeopardize your retirement goals if you're not careful. So with that in mind, today I'm gonna share some financial spring cleaning tips. We'll cover tips to help you get organized, decrease your spending, increase your savings, and to make sure you keep your eyes on the prize and that's achieving your retirement goals. So let's begin with getting organized. If you're like most people, your finances might need cleaning, not just figuratively, but literally. You might have many important documents stored and poorly organized in paper form. Go through them and decide what you need to keep and what you can throw out. What you throw out, you can shred or burn to avoid the possibility of identity theft. And consider scanning the rest and storing them on your computer and make sure though, if you're gonna do that, you back them up to be safe. Next, review all your insurance policies. Why? Because you wanna make sure that they're still right for your current needs and you're not paying for benefits that you don't need. So reach out to your insurance providers and talk about opportunities to lower your rates without compromising your coverage. A lower monthly rate means you'll have more money to funnel into savings or to pay off debts. Which brings me to my next spring cleaning tip which is review your plan for paying down debt, or make a plan if you don't already have one. If you feel overwhelmed, or you just aren't sure really where to start, then reach out to a credit counseling agency for help. Now, let's talk about some ways to help you decrease what you spend and to increase what you save. First, review your monthly budget, or start keeping a monthly budget if you're not doing so already. Take a hard look at discretionary spending, things like clothing, gadgets, entertainment, and so forth, and set spending limits in various categories. Then put all of your so-called necessary expenses under the same microscope and look for opportunities to save. Here's where you can do things like canceling unused or unnecessary subscriptions. In fact, try this exercise. List every subscription you pay for, whether monthly or yearly, which means streaming services, computer software, gym memberships, club memberships, magazines, and so on. And after you have the list, ask yourself, do I use this subscription multiple times a month? And or does it make my life noticeably better? If the answer is no, then perhaps you should consider canceling the subscription. Next, plan and budget for irregular expenses for the rest of the year. These are things like weddings, birthday gifts, vacation spending, Christmas shopping. The best way to handle irregular expenses is to set aside a savings account specifically for those. Don't try to guess how much you'll need to cover these expenses. Instead, give yourself a limit and save toward that amount. Now, let's talk about some more ways that you can save uh, and really to get geared toward your retirement. First, adjust your tax withholding if necessary. Talk with your employer or consult a tax professional if you need help ensuring that you, you're having just the right amount of tax taken out of your paycheck. Overpaying taxes, or frankly underpaying them and getting hit with penalties come tax time, means that you have less money to funnel into your retirement savings account. Which brings me to my next tip. Try to maximize your retirement account contributions if you're not already doing so. You can take advantage of catch-up contributions if you're age 50 and over. Then you can review your retirement accounts with your financial advisor to help ensure that they're on track for your goals. That tees up my next tip. Re review your financial goals, starting with long-term goals. Once you're clear on those long-term goals, then you can actually work backward. You can set shorter-term goals for the next two to five years. Then you can narrow those down to your financial goals for this year that you really want to achieve. Now, let's talk a bit more about making sure that your current actions are in line with your goals. I just mentioned the importance of setting your long-term goals for retirement if you haven't done so already. But I want to stress that one again because it's crucial. Next, review your asset allocation. Here's the fact. Your ideal asset allocation changes over time. 
because when you're 30s or 40s, your financial goals are mainly growth-based. You're in your accumulation stage of your life. For most people, it can make sense to have a more aggressive allocation at that time. But once you're past the age of 50, you're getting closer to the time when your priorities begin to shift. With retirement getting closer, you'll need to start thinking about your, how your assets are going to help you generate reliable retirement income. But that's not all. You'll also need an asset allocation and an overall strategy that helps protect you from the eroding effects of inflation for up to 30 years or more of retirement. Also one that helps you minimize the tax burden, helps you maximize Social Security, helps you satisfy your RMDs without cannibalizing your principal, one that's right for your risk tolerance, one that helps you allow, allows you to continue growing your principal organically with less risk, and most importantly, one that helps you reduce your stress during retirement. Now, as we all know, it has to be aligned to your specific retirement goals. In my experience, these are just some of the benefits of having the right income-based financial strategy, preferably an actively managed strategy geared toward interest and dividend return and designed to work regardless of market conditions. To help me out with this also important topic, we're bringing in Jerry Sluzewicz, uh, founder of Pacific Financial Partners, located in Southern California. Jerry, it's been a little while, but it's always great to have you here. Yeah, thanks for uh, having me. Good to see you again. Again, still remotely, but uh, good to see you. Same here. So, you know, a lot of studies, a lot of surveys show that people are just really not good managers of their finances. Tell us in your own words why you think that is. Well, it goes back to our educational system, Dave. Uh, it's just not taught in schools. It's not a priority. It's not taught anywhere, really. I mean, these are things that you kind of got to learn on your own. There's plenty of information to do it. But, you know, once people uh, get out of the schooling uh, years, they get into a job, then they start getting busy with family and, you know, they take up their hobbies and they have their interests. And it just doesn't really seem like a priority because retirement's years and years away. And then they start to get older, they have other distractions, and it just really seems like, you know, people don't make it a priority in their lives to, uh, other than participate maybe in their 401k plan or something like that, to really focus on how to do things right. Yeah, yeah. So, okay, um, people have a lot of room for improvement then, which is a positive. I know your guy always likes to look at the positive side, the glass half full. So how do you recommend people do that? If people want to become more financially literate, what are some things they can do so they can learn more so they can become better managers of their finances? Well, again, a program like yours. I mean, you bring on uh, yourself and a lot of guests to try to do financial education. One of the concerns there is sometimes there's a little too much information and they don't know necessarily what's good or bad, but if they have a discerning mind and somewhat successful, they should be able to sort through it. But it, just like anything, any skill that you want to develop, Dave, you got to take the time and the energy to make it a priority and spend the time researching, you know, how to make things better for yourself. And, and some of it's common sense, too. So yeah. it, it really just comes to making it a priority. And, I, and I'll be honest with you, when you start looking at spending 20, 30 years of your life in retirement, it really should be a priority for everybody. I mean, another word for retirement is unemployment. And what if you're going to become unemployed for the next 30 years? You know, are you ready for that? Well, that's mm -hmm. kind of retirement. So they have the they have the impetus to do it, but it's just a matter of taking self-action, if you will. You know, there's always so much time in the day, Jerry, but you know, we find time, some of us find time to work out on a regular basis, some of us find time to go to Bible study on a regular basis. So if you just said, I'm going to block out an hour or two a week, whether it's to watch videos, like you said, watching us, or, or whether it's just reading about financial issues, uh, you know, just a small amount of time like that every week multiplied over the course of 20 years makes a big difference in your knowledge level, right? Absolutely. I mean, you, you read things like uh, successful people like Warren Buffett, Bill Gates, you know, that's what they say. They say reading is one of the most important um, aspects of your life. Uh, people used to ask me what I do for a living. And I said, I read for a living. And, and yeah. really, I mean, obviously I do a lot more than that, but you've got to do that self-education and you're just doing a little bit every week, you know, a little bit uh, all the time, that compound knowledge, uh, especially as you get closer to retirement, as your nest egg gets bigger, 
it becomes more valuable that you spent that time early and often, mm -hmm. and even if you didn't start early, no time like the present to get started. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, some people think that they can just maybe not be good money managers, not be good investors, but they can just save a ton of money. They can be good savers and, and they can overcome other faults. Why is that not really true? Well, having a uh, participating in a retirement plan like a 401k, 403b, or an IRA or something like that is not retirement planning. You know, th those are two separate. Saving money, yeah, that's you know that's part of it. Having your own money because you don't want to just depend on Social Security for for your retirement. But it's it, it's so much more complex than that. There's a lot of moving parts. Social Security, when to take it? You can take that anytime between 62 and 70. But when's the optimal time? And when's the optimal time if you're married? How about taxes? Uh, Dave, I, I had a client I talked to the other day. He's pushing in, in his 80s. And uh, he, he was an executive well, with one of the big defense companies, participated in their 401k and actually did save, you know, seven-figure uh, 401k. And he was only with me the last couple of years now. And, and we were having this discussion about his RMD, and he is now stuck paying more taxes today yeah. than he did when he was an executive with a with, with a defense contractor. Because not taking into account inflation, not taking into account the timing, you know, he probably should have delayed taking his Social Security versus retiring early, drawn off his 401k for a few years, allowed that Social Security to compound. So there's a lot more things. And then you start taking in, like I said, taxes and inflation with what's going on today, you know, people are really starting to realize, you know, wow, there's a lot to this retirement planning yeah. stuff. So give me two or three quick tips for someone watching who wants to be a good, a good steward, a better steward of their money. Well, I, I think it starts with, I, I use that, the old Ben Franklin T pros and cons. I put mm -hmm. income and expenses instead of pros and cons. You've got to know what your expenses are first. And a lot of people, and again, I don't want to call them lazy, but they just don't really take into account what their expenses are. Most people, when they get close to retirement, they're not trying to jump into another strata. I suddenly want to go where I'm flying private jets uh, and, 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 and taking limousines. They, they just want to live the lifestyle that they become accustomed to. Well, most people I find don't know what it costs them to live. And it's not really hard to find. You need to know what your costs are. And then you need to know where your income sources are going to come mm -hmm. from. What are you going to get from Social Security? Are you going to get a pension? Is there any other things you have? Alimony, lottery winnings, uh, divorce settlements, mineral rights. And then you've got to start saying, okay, now I've got my base of, of, of savings, that 401k or whatever they participated in. And then what's the withdrawal rate? And that silent killer inflation, you got to ca calculate what those costs are going to are going to be over time. So you have income and expenses really are your two basic things, Dave, and you've got to know what those two things are. Then that sets up the withdrawal rate. And you could basically, once you start withdrawing from your assets, you can figure out how long your money's going to last. For some people that could be 40, 50 years, and they'll be okay. For other people, it's going to be 10 years or less. They're not okay. So and then the second major point, Dave, if I will, is once you figure those out, You've got to come up with a plan and it really should be in writing. It doesn't need to be in stone, but you've got to have an idea of how you're going to pay for these things and put it down. So you're, if you're married, your spouse is on the same page as you. Mm -hmm. If you become incapacitated, whoever your caregivers are going to come in, they, they have that plan. Because if it's just in your head and not written down, it's an idea, not a plan. Yeah. Yep. That's right. It's a wish, not a goal. If you write it down, it's an actual goal. So lastly, you know, take a look at what's going on in the world today, financially in the financial markets. And why should that serve as a motivation today for those who aren't good money managers, but really do want to become better stewards of their money? Yeah, great question, Dave, is that if today's environment doesn't stimulate you to get on that retirement planning gig, then nothing will, in my opinion. We all can see what's happened to costs like gasoline, food, housing costs. And to think that, you know, your plan is, well, I hope it all goes back down so it's more affordable for me. Uh, that's living in a pipe dream. Generally, inflation goes up and then it just stabilizes. The price don't go higher. They might, they might stabilize at this new higher level. So 
people got to figure out that these costs, these rising costs, we had no inflation for basically 40 years or declining inflation for 40 years. And now they see that that silent killer, as it was called, is, is not so silent anymore. And that what they thought they had as maybe a secure retirement isn't so secure anymore. So it better give them the impetus to really start looking into how all these different moving factors are going to affect their life. Because everyone desires longevity, right? Nobody wants to die. I don't find that with any of my clients. And I deal with, you know, kind of the senior market. And uh, the longer you live, the more bear markets you're going to have, the more inflation is going to affect you, uh, the higher cost of medical and, and the higher risk of having long-term care. How are you going to pay for all of that? Yeah. You need that plan today. And when you're starting, hopefully, in your 50s and 60s, there's a lot you can do, especially with taxes, that you can't control once you hit that RMD, the required minimum distribution age, which today is 72. Uh, then you're kind of stuck with whatever the government tells you. Mm -hmm. I think you're right. The, the biggest one, the biggest thing is the longer people live, the more they've got to be aware of all these pitfalls. You know, uh, initially when Social Security started, as you well know, people were collecting benefits at 65, but the average life expectancy was 67. Well, if you're only going to live two years, you take your money, you cut it in half. You spend half it the first year, half it the second year, and it's that easy. But when you might live 30 years or more in retirement, it's a whole different story. Jerry Sluzewicz, again, great having you here. Really appreciate your time. As usual, great words of wisdom. Thank you. Thank you again, Dave. Thank you for watching today's video, Financial Spring Cleaning Tips. If you enjoyed it, click the thumbs up button, give us a like, and make sure that you subscribe to our YouTube channel for new content each and every week.